Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this month's Department of the Interior Museum lecture. My name is Diana Ziegler. I'm the director of the Department of the Interior Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today. Um, before we get started with the lecture, I do want to give you a heads up. Unfortunately, our museum is currently closed for an unscheduled uh, maintenance issue. So if you're planning to uh, visit the museum after the lecture or before the lecture, um, you know that it is now closed. Uh, so we should be up and running probably within a week's time or so. Um, this month, we are kind of taking a break from the summer heat here in Washington, D.C. And, and giving you some nice, cool views of glaciers. Um, I'm very happy to be introducing Bruce Franklin Molnia, um, Dr. Molnia. This is his second time pre presenting in our lecture series, and we really enjoyed his first lecture um, a couple years ago. Uh, so he is an award-winning research geologist who conducted glacial marine remote sensing and coastal research for more than 50 years. Uh, Molnia has conducted and participated in more than 50 expeditions and research cruises to every continent. Uh, since 1971, when he was a South Carolina Public Television Network science editor. Uh, Molnia focused on presenting understandable science to the public, um, policymakers, media, and his peers. Uh, these research and education efforts have earned him the Department of the Interior Meritus Service Award, the U.S. Geological Survey's Lifetime Communication Achievement Award, and the Geological Survey, or excuse me, Ge Geological Society of America's Career Achievement and Public Service Awards. The International DVD Association's Government DVD of the Year Award and three USGS Eugene Shoemaker External Communication Awards. Uh, Molnia has presented more than 500 public lectures, so this one better be a good one. Yeah. <laughs> um, he was trained, or he has trained the U.S. National Park Service and Forest Service Rangers, and has been visiting lecture. Vis a visiting lecturer on the Cruise West and Holland America cruises. Uh, after teaching at Amherst College, Molnia joined the Bureau of Land Management in 1973 and the USGS in 1974. Initially, Molnia led environmental hazards investigations uh, off the Gulf of, Me of Alaska continental shelf, focused on understanding the potential impact of offshore oil gas development. Uh, later, Molnia led an inter excuse me, interdisciplinary research group studying environmental and climate change in the Bering and Malaspina glaciers, uh, two largest glaciers in the continental North America. Um, from 1998 to 2003, uh, Dr. Molnia served as the U.S. House of Representatives Senior Legislative Fellow in the office of Congressman Kurt Weldon. Uh, where he performed and operated the House Oceans Caucus, a bipartisan caucus formulated to educate Congress and the public uh, about critical ocean issues. For more than a decade, Dr. Molnia has also been responsible for USGS, USGS International Environment and international polar activities. Uh, prior to starting the Oceans Caucus, Molnia served as the USGS Acting Chief of International Programs. Uh, from 1985 to 1987, Molnia was Acting Executive Director of the National Research Council's Polar Research Board. And during the 1990s, Molnia investigated marine contamination and radioactive waste uh, disposal issues in the Arctic and the Russian Far East. Um, he has a PhD from marine geology uh, from the University of South Carolina, an MA in marine geology from Duke University, and a BA in geology from Bingham Binghamton University. Uh, Molnia has authored and co-authored or edited more than 400 articles, abstracts, maps, and books, as well as more than 100 monthly columns for GSA Today the monthly newspaper of the Geological Society of America. Uh, Molnia's books include Alaska's Glaciers, Glacial Mar Marine Sedimentation, uh, Glaciers of Alaska, and the Satellite Image Atlas of Glaciers of the World, Alaska. From 1992 to 1994, Molnia chaired the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, um, the Arctic Contamination Technical Planning Committee, which conducted the first international workshop on Arctic contamination. 
Um, Molnia was also appointed the advisory committee uh, to, on protection of the sea advisory board on pollution control and prevention. Uh, currently, he is the USGS senior science advisor. Um, Molnia has held adjunct faculty positions um, professor positions at the University of Alaska Fairbanks School of Fisheries and Ocean Science, Duke University's Nicholas School of the Environment, uh, University of Idaho, and Color California State University, Northridge. Molnia um, is the recipient of the Antarctic Service Medal and the namesake for Molnia Buff in Antarctica's dry valleys. I don't think many of our lecturers can have that claim to me. So uh, please welcome Dr. Molnia. Thank you very much. I apologize. I didn't realize that the introduction was going to be that long and detailed. So um, thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> so I'm here to talk to you about Glacier Bay, one of the first places that I worked from the perspective of trying to understand how glacier behavior could have an impact on oil and gas activities. And as we got more and more in depth into trying to understand where you could safely place a facility along the coast of Alaska that might have a 50-year life expectancy, it became very clear that you had to understand what glaciers had done for the previous 100 to 200 years to be able to try to predict what they might do in the future. So the study of glacier behavior became a very important part of understanding the basic context of how uh, facilities could be placed, what the impact of icebergs might be, uh, glacier outburst floods, uprivers, any number of things that might not be a standard part of what would be analyzed when you start looking at basic oil and gas placements. So I've had a tremendous opportunity to visit many of the larger uh, glaciers in Alaska, especially the ones that have a marine terminus or they're located adjacent to fjords. And I've been photographing glaciers in Alaska for almost 50 years. And so what you'll see is a presentation that combines some of the history of exploration focusing on what John Muir did, as well as imagery dating back to almost the time of John Muir, paired with modern images to show how the landscapes of Glacier Bay have evolved and changed over the previous 100 plus years. So I call this in the footsteps of John Muir. And let me just reiterate my purpose. Two purposes here. One is to describe Glacier Bay as it looked when it was first seen by John Muir at the end of the 19th century. Now, John Muir visited Glacier Bay five times. And so we're going to begin at the time of his 1879 quote unquote discovery. And then, as I've mentioned, second to document how Glacier Bay landscape has changed in the nearly 140 years since Muir's first visit. So, quote unquote, Muir discovered Glacier Bay in 1879 visited it again in 1880, 1890, 1896, and 1899 when he was part of the Harriman expedition. So he had a 20-year window to watch the landscape evolve. Now, interestingly, um, Glacier Bay hadn't been lost, and so um, John Muir's discovery is uh, more of a uh, media event than it is a reality, but he was the first explorer, first Caucasian explorer to visit Glacier Bay. And at the time that he visited it, the glaciers in Glacier Bay had been retreating for approximately 130 years. In the middle of the 18th century, they had reached what we call it's their little ice age maximum. And at that point, there was no Glacier Bay. This large ice mass, which I refer to as the Glacier Bay Glacier, actually extended all the way into the northern reaches of the Pacific Ocean. As the glacier began to retreat, it became a habitat for seals and the local Huna tribe, which inhibited the area for thousands of years called the bay that was forming Sitakaday and or Ice Bay, and they used it primarily for seal hunting. So this is a map of what Glacier Bay would have looked like about the time of John Muir's visits. His first visit was 1879, and as I'll describe to you in the next couple of slides, his first place that he made a landfall was over here at what he named Geike Glacier, then he was up here exploring U. Miller, went past Huna Glacier, which is now called Johns Hopkins, visited Grand Pacific, passed what was called Carroll Glacier, and then exited the bay. Period of residence for John Muir in Glacier Bay during his 1879 discovery was five days. Miserable weather. He was there in late October, which is not the time to go 
canoeing or kayaking in Glacier Bay. And he was there at the beginning of Ice Up. And one of the biggest concerns that the um, uh, claimants who were working with him had was getting frozen into the ice and not being able to get out. So it was a very quick visit by John Muir. The glacier that's named for him, Muir Glacier, he never actually got to look at in the 1879 visit. In fact, he describes on the last day as they were exiting and sailing past going on the very west side of the bay, being able to look up, it was the first clear day they had, being able to look up the terminus of Muir Glacier and see this extensive field of tributaries all coming in. Muir was an amazing scientist for someone who was pretty much self-taught. And the reason he was in Alaska in 1879 was he was trying to understand what modern glaciers do because he was in the middle of a number of arguments with scientists of his time about how the features in Yosemite and how the features in the European Alps came to be. And so he felt if he could go to a place where there were live glaciers, he would be able to get the basic insight and to see live real-time processes. And so his first choice was coastal Alaska and the fortuitous finding of Glacier Bay gave him a venue that he returned to time and time again. Muir made an additional trip to Alaska. He believed incorrectly that if he went north in Alaska, he would see real big glaciers, that he would actually see something on a you know, comparable to the continental scale glaciers that covered, as we now realize, most of the northern hemisphere during the, little, during the Pleistocene, so during a period of time ending about 20,000 years ago. So he went on to a um, U.S. Coast Survey and U.S. Navy expedition on a ship called the Corwin that actually was still trying to find survivors from the Franklin expedition or any information about um, um, lost British explorers up in the Arctic. And much to Muir's chagrin, he discovered there are no large glaciers up on the west coast or north coast of Alaska. So that was one of the um, incentives for him to come back multiple times between 1879 and 1899 to, um, to get a look at Alaska. So this is a summary. He said, having spent only five days in Stackaday, sailing around it, visiting and sketching all the six glaciers, especially the largest, which was named after him two years after his visit by the Coast Survey, though I landed only on three of them, the Geike, U. Miller, and Grand Pacific, the freezing of the fjords in front of the other uh, in front of the others, rendering them inaccessible at this late season. And then if you go to um, an article he published uh, about 10 years after his quote-unquote first visit, he describes on a day-to-day -day basis what he did and what he saw. And so he describes the first glacier he saw um, as the Geike. He said, it's lofty blue cliffs looming through the draggled skirts of the clouds, giving a tremendous impression of savage power while the roar of newborn, newborn icebergs thickened and emphasized the general roar of the storm because it was stormy almost the entire time they were there. And staying dry and finding firewood was one of the um, major life support issues that they had during the time of Muir's exploration. The, um, the, the Klingets who were rowing his boat and sailing with him couldn't understand why anyone would be interested in looking at these ice mountains, as they called them, um, as opposed to trying to survive in what was a really, really harsh environment during the uh, week that they were there in October. So that was Saturday. The second day where he was there, they did virtually nothing because his, his um, primary accompaniment was um, a um, missionary from Sitka. And um, Sunday being a religious day, they everybody stayed in camp except for Muir. He climbed one of the mountains by where they were camped and got a minimal view of what there was to see because of the weather. But the following day, Monday, they took off and they reached the second of the biggest glaciers, Hugh Miller. And he describes it as we rode, up the fjord, we rode up the fjord and landed to make a slight examination of its grand frontal wall. And his prose is amazing. And when you read many of the things that he um, wrote about Alaska, it's very inspirational. He also uh, recognized very quickly, and he had been in California for many years before he went to Alaska. But he said, you don't want to go to Alaska as a youth because it will spoil you for the rest of your life. And he said, you know, almost every corner you turn, there's a Yosemite-like valley that no one knew about. And he was talking about what he saw in Prince William Sound and along the coast. So the topography is, if you're familiar with Yosemite, it's Yosemite-like, but much, much, much more, much larger and much more intense. And so Muir, Muir described it extremely well. On the third day, they crossed the fjord, landed on the south side of the rock that divides the wall of the Great Glacier, which he named Grand Pacific. 
Um, he went all over Alaska by himself. You know, he had support. But when it came to examining glaciers, he would go for long walks um, by himself. Uh, didn't matter what the weather conditions were. And he describes it in great detail. He says here, for a distance of 15 or 20 miles, the river-like ice flood is nearly level. And when it recedes, the ocean waters will follow it, and thus form a long extension of the fjord, with features essentially the same as those now extending into the continent further south, where many great glaciers once poured into the sea, though scarce a, vi um, a vestige of them now exists. So he understood this concept of glacier advance and glacier retreat. And it's really interesting, you know, especially this paragraph, because I was involved in a um, suit that went to the Supreme Court about a decade ago. And the question was, who owns submer the submerged lands in Glacier Bay? If it was the state of Alaska, they would also control the fisheries rights. If it was the Park Service, they could control the number of cruise ships that came in. So it went through all the courts and finally made it to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled that the state of Alaska, which was um, actually when Glacier Bay was first set up as a national monument almost 95 years ago, uh, there was no state of Alaska. It was a territory. And so there, um, according to the court, there were different rights and responsibilities in terms of the lands. But when Coolidge, who was the president at the time, proclaimed the national monument, the rationale was based on several things. One was the majestic mountains and deep fjords. That's how it was described by one of the early naturalists, William Cooper. And so that was in the language that was um, actually in the proclamation. So based on the description that I wrote and several others prepared about the relationship between tidewater glaciers and fjords, and Muir's recollection of, or um, actually realization, about the relationship between glaciers filling fjords and the bays coming and going time and time again as climate changed, uh, the, out the ultimate outcome of the Supreme Court decision was on the, uh, um, in favor of the federal government, giving the Park Service the regulatory rights of the submerged waters in Glacier Bay and that has led to um, um, prohibition of fishing in the bay, and commercial fishing in the bay, and a number of other regulations to protect and preserve the environment. But a lot of this was predicated on the work of John Muir and some of the other early naturalists whom Muir interacted with. And then lastly, um, on the fifth day, they, as they exited, they went and visited the Geike Glacier and got their first view of what uh, is now named Muir Glacier. And Muir states, you know, um, after examining the front of beautiful Geike Glacier, we obtained our first broad view of the Great Glacier, afterwards named the Muir, because it had been named while well, he was still alive, and he was aware of it when he wrote his description years later. The last of all of the grand company to be seen, the stormy weather having hidden it when we first entered the bay. It was now perfectly clear, and the spacious prairie-like glacier with its many tributaries extending far back into the snowy uh, recesses of, the, of its fountains made a magnificent display of its wealth and I was strongly tempted to go and explore it at all hazards. But winter had come, and the freezing of its fjords was an insurmountable obstacle. I had therefore to be content for the present with sketching and studying its main features at a distance. And so he came back, especially um, in 1890 and 91, and actually there was a cabin built by John Muir and a group of four or five others at what, at what is now called Muir Point. And he spent most of the summer there working with a um, scientist named Harry Reed, Harry F. Reed, who later was the principal investigator, actually, in terms of uh, the details of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. And Reed um, actually set up the first observatory in Glacier Bay in 1891 in Tidal Inlet and was able to measure the tides and between uh, various visits that Reed made, get some idea of the rates of change. Reed went back for the last time to Glacier Bay in 1931. So there's this long history of people who interacted with John Muir. I had a colleague named William Field, who was the um, head of the Harvard Mountaineering Club in the 1920s. And Reed showed up on campus at Harvard in 1921 and tried to recruit members of the Harvard Mountaineering Club to actually go back and photograph the glaciers that Reed had photographed in 1890 and 91. And so Bill Field um, took the challenge and spent the next 65 years of his life photographing glaciers, not only in Glacier Bay, but other parts of the world. And he left a legacy, several tens of thousands of photographs that are now at the University of Alaska and at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. And they serve as a sort of an anchor for systematic evaluation of how the fjords in Glacier Bay have changed and how the landscape 
in Alaska and glaciated areas has changed over the last century plus. So, as I said, I call this in the footsteps of John Muir, and we're gonna, what we're going to do is sort of transition from a description of Muir and his visit to um, a look at how Glacier Bay has changed through repeat photography. And you'll see this in uh, much more detail in a minute, but this is a triplet of pictures, 1941 photograph by William Field, um, 1950 photograph by one of his colleagues, um, Bill Millette, all taken from the same place in a picture I took in 2004. And between 1941 and 1950, the glacier retreated more than a mile. And between 1950 and 2004, in that 54-year period, not only did the glacier retreat out of the field of view, but a vertical thickness of almost 2,300 feet of ice disappeared. And a bare bedrock landscape became densely vegetated. So when I first started looking at Glacier Bay, my focus was on trying to document how glacier terminus positions had changed and thicknesses had changed. But very quickly, it became clear that the emphasis was far more than just looking at glacier behavior. It was looking at ecosystem evolution. Because it became very clear that in many of these places that came out from under the ice as nothing more than muddy, wet bedrock surfaces, within half a, half a century, were densely vegetated. And as soon as the first vegetation came in, in comes the insects. And as soon as the insects came in, the birds came. And as soon as the birds came in, small mammals came. And before you knew it, you had an instant ecosystem where in places the um, prevailing um, forest literature says it takes 300 to 400 years to get a mature forest because of seeds blowing in and having this uh, uh, wet glacial mud to, to land on, you get um, mature, what would be end members of a, a forest ecosystem developing um, right at the beginning in some cases. Baby springs starting to develop as soon as, the, uh, as soon as the will and the alder come in. So you see rapid evolution of landscapes as um, triggered by the rapid glacier retreat. So I became focused on Glacier Bay um, in the early 21st century in response to a sort of a challenge from Secretary, Deputy Secretary of Interior David Hayes. He called a group of um, scientists from USGS and several of the other bureaus together. And he said, I need unambiguous anecdotal examples of changing climate that can be broadly shared. And my response was, what can be more unambiguous and um, anecdotal than a pair of photographs, one taken sometime in the past showing what the landscape looked like, and one taken today, side by side, where you can hand them to somebody, you don't have to tell them, well, this is due to such and such, but you can let them look at these photos and make determinations from, the, from, from what's been changing by themselves. So I'll skip over the background, but basically I started in five locations, Glacier Bay being one of them, trying to systematically photograph glaciers. And over the last 17 years, I've been to more than 225 different locations in southern and southeastern Alaska with historic photographs in hand and successfully made about 175 pairs or triplets in some cases showing landscape change um, in some cases where the original photographs date back to 1883. In some other locations, as you'll see, the quote-unquote original photographs are pictures I took in the 1970s. And so in the upper part of Muir Inlet, when the glacier was rapidly retreating, there had no, no one had been there before because the areas were inaccessible. And so some of my early visits to Glacier Bay provided some of the first photo documentation of what happened in the upper end of Muir Inlet. So let's begin just to make sure everybody's familiar with where Glacier Bay is. This is southeastern Panhandle of Alaska. This is Glacier Bay located here. Coast Mountains, Fairweather Mountains, St. Elias Mountains. So it's at the junction of the Coast Mountains and the Fairweather St. Elias Range. It is an area of rapid tectonic uplift because the plate boundary is actually just outside of Glacier Bay. And North America and plate is being squeezed and uplifted by the Pacific Plate, which is pushing northward. And so there have been high mountains there for several millions of years. And there's probably been continuous glaciation in the higher mountains in Glacier Bay for several million years. But at lower elevations, the glaciers come and the glaciers go as temperature fluctuates. 
And so what we're seeing now is the retreat of glacier buildup that's taken place over the last couple of thousand years. So this is a photograph by Grove Carl Gilbert, taken during the time of the Harriman Expedition. I tell people who ask me that question, there are two months of the year in Alaska, summer and winter. It's either snow covered or it's snow free. Glaciers don't fluctuate like this on an annual basis. Um, the landscape's either white or you can then, when it's not white, you can see vegetation, rocks, water. But um, no, um, generally they're not. And generally if you see a photograph and there isn't dense snow covering everything, it had, it had to have been either July or August, even back 120 years ago. So, no, they are not. Some of the more recent ones are marked, but um, typically, as I try to explain, you either can see the ice or you can't. It, it doesn't matter, and it's not going to change um, by more than several feet between April, May, or June, or July. So let me do this progression. So 1879, and we're going to walk away. We're going to move 104 years into the future, and that's the same landscape. So I'll go back. This is what it looked like when Gilbert was there and when Muir was there. Muir was there with Gilbert when Gilbert took this photograph in 1899. And this is what that same landscape looked like at the beginning of the 21st century. Now, why is that the case? If you look at this, one of my colleagues, Ron Carpillo, put together some very, very beautiful um, early maps and brought them up to date. This is how it happened at the time of Glacier Bay being completely filled. About 1750 was the maximum. And in the first 100 years, we lost about 30 kilometers of the length of the glacier. By 1890, we lost more than 60 kilometers of the length of the glacier. By 1937, Muir Inlet, which is um, the east arm of Glacier Bay, was formed and was about 20 kilometers long. And it's lengthened since then. Everything else had pretty much retreated close to its minimum size by the first third of the end of the 20th century. 1964, 1985. So you can see the, the geometry of Glacier Bay was pretty well set by um, 90 years ago. And so the first 100 plus years of retreat at Glacier Bay was really dramatic. So we're going to take, and so these are the terminus positions of the glaciers that the stars represent where the ice is today, or in 2003, um, of the glaciers that Muir visited in 1879. And just to bring it up to date, this is what Glacier Bay looks like this year. This is a MODIS image from NASA. Uh, one of my colleagues who worked in Glacier Bay for almost 50 years, a guy named Austin Post, who was a survey USGS hydrologist, um, visited Glacier Bay probably 25 times over a 50-year time period. And he started to say, by about 1980, they needed to rename it. He said, you know, it really shouldn't be called Glacier Bay anymore. It should be called Timber Bay. So we're going to start looking at the evolution of Glacier Bay by comparing modern and historical photographs. And we're going to begin in the Lower Muir Inlet. And this is the very first photograph of Glacier Bay. It's probably 1883, Terminus of Muir Inlet. Tourists started showing up within four years of Muir's visit. And this is a photograph that a Boston photographer named Partridge took in 1886. And the newspaper started to proclaim, you know, see the great glacier wonder of the world. And you could take cruises from Bellingham or from Tacoma up to Glacier Bay. It's a two-week round trip on steamships. And prior to 1899, when there was a massive earthquake that, quote, unquote, changed the um, um, calving behavior of the glaciers in Glacier Bay so that there was so much ice, the cruise ships couldn't get in there anymore. But in that first almost 20 years following the uh, the visit of, of Muir, uh, it became a tourist destination, a premier tourist destination. And this coincided with the development and the sale of personal cameras. Um, George Eastman from um, Rochester, New York, who eventually was responsible for Eastman Kodak, discover, you know, discovered a way of packaging a 100 exposure length roll of film into a camera that you could then send back to Kodak in Rochester, and they would develop your film, put another 100 frames in it, and you could take pictures. So people showed up with their own cameras, and photography of Alaskan glaciers started. But here you can see a photographer in a top hat with a big box camera 
notice the bustle on this woman standing on an iceberg? But that's how tourists dressed when they visited Alaska, you know, 140 years ago. And just to answer your question about time, I don't know what month they were there. There's no record, in fact, of when what date this picture was taken. But this is an August photograph of the exact same place. And you might ask, how do I know that? And the simple answer is, do you see this here and here? Those are the only bedrock outcrops that are big enough that they would be visible from the general location of the mouth of Muir Inlet. So again, here's one of the steamships. This is the Queen. This is an 1895 photograph. Um, considering the snow on the ground, it could be as early as May. This is what that landscape looked like in June of 2004. So what I would do is I describe, you go from black and white, ice and bed, bare bedrock in places, to blue and green. That's what Glacier Bay looks like now in most places, blue and green. Black and white to blue and green. So moving further along, we're going to continue up towards Muir Point, where Muir's cabin was built. This is one of the pictures that Harry Reid, where I mentioned to you earlier, took in 1892. Considering the absence of snow on the mountains, it probably is August. Here's a picture I took, August 2005. Same field of view. What's different? It's now dense vegetation, that large spruce and hemlock. And you know, there's a little bit of uh, this snow and ice up here in this little fjord. I'm sorry, a little cirque, but um, for the most part, you know, there's no icebergs to be seen. The ice glacier terminus, closest glacier terminus to this, is probably about 30 miles away now. 1899, another photograph from Gilbert, from the Harriman Expedition. Same landscape in 2003. I've already showed you this pair, but Again, 1899, September 2003. Moving further up the inlet, when Muir first appeared, you can see here's the 1860, 1892, um, 1929. This is a photograph from the 1931 time period showing the entrance to Wachusett's Inlet. And this is 1931, same field of view in 2003. If you go up the inlet, this is a picture that was taken by Field in 1961. So we've moved about 15 kilometers from where the ice was in the 1920s to where the ice is now in the 1960s. And so this is a picture that Field took. Notice the foreground, it's glacial till. You can see some of the bedrock sticking through but there's no vegetation to be seen. And now we're going to jump from 1961 to 2003. So we're 42 years later. And look at the change in the landscape. The ice is gone except for a small remnant retreating valley glacier up here. And Muir put, I'm sorry, not Muir, but Field put two of his field party out here on the point. See the two people sitting there? I tried to get two of my colleagues out there. Here they are in their orange vest, but the vegetation was so dense, they couldn't work their way through the alder. So rapid, rapid evolution from bare bedrock to there's a cottonwood here. This is September. So it's starting to change color. But most of this is alder, there's cottonwood here, alder and willow. But rapid evolution from bare bedrock to vegetation in periods, in this case, it's 42 years. 1941 photograph by John Reed, who was a USGS geologist. Same location in September 2003. Now it gets interesting for me. This is a photograph I took in 1980. And at that point, McBride Glacier was sitting right adjacent to the main part of Muir Inlet. This is a photograph taken 23 years later. And it's now retreated about three miles. And to help put this in perspective, this is where it was in 1980. This is where it was about 2003. This is where it is in 2009. 
And then I was there last year, and it's retreated from about here to here between 2009 and 2015. This is the photograph I started with the Bill Field picture, the first of the triplet, 1941. If you look here, it's rock till there's some cobbles and boulders, no sign of vegetation. Notice this is Riggs Glacier here, Muir Glacier here. This is the confluence of the two. By 2004, Muir Glacier is another six miles off to the left. And the landscape has changed dramatically. So 1941, 2004, and again, I repeat the triplet, 1941. 1950-2004. This is what Riggs Glacier looked like September of last year. Riggs, if you remember, is this ice mass coming in here. It was still connected in 1950. It was a standalone glacier, but it was still tidewater in 2004. Now it's retreated so that none of its terminus, and it's separated into two separate glaciers, but neither of its termini actually make contact with the fjord anymore. And in fact, the number of tidewater glaciers in Glacier Bay has decreased about 75% during the last century. And one of the questions that I get asked by um, some of the park management officials is, when will we not have tidewater glaciers, Glacier Bay, Kenai Fjords, because the tidewater glaciers are probably the, the driving tourist attraction. So that's the tourist attractor. They want to see icebergs calving from the terminus of glaciers. And icebergs do not care from glaciers that are sitting on land. So as climate continues to change and as Alaska continues to warm, what we're going to see is ultimate disappearance of the tidewater ends of many of the glaciers. Glaciers will still be there because we have glaciers in Alaska that go from elevations of actually, in many cases, hundreds of meters below sea levels, where the beds of some of these are, to elevations as high as 20,000 feet above sea level. So even as climate changes, what you'll see is a final stabilization of, of glacier termini at elevations that are comparable and, and, and um, um, within the range of temperatures that will stabilize once climate changes, however it's going to change. But I want to point out one other thing about this location. Notice this line here. It's an area that had been covered by the glaciers so you've got fresh bedrock below and weathered bedrock above. If we go back and look at the historic image, this is the 1941 image. That line corresponds to the height of the ice in 1941. And you can see not only have we lost about 1,700 feet above sea level here, but there's another 600 or so feet below sea level, giving us the maximum thickness there of about 2,300 feet of ice that's disappeared. So to put that in perspective from a different look, this is an aerial view. This is a picture I took in 2004. This is where the terminus of the ice was in 1941. This is where McBride Glacier sits. This is McBride Inlet. The ice was here in 1978, 1980. Here's where the terminus of Muir was in 1950. And now the terminus of Muir is way off the image, about four and a half miles to the west. And this picture I took last summer probably shows it better. Here we are looking at the terminus of McBride. This is where it sat at the time. This is where um, Muir was in 1941. McBride was connected to it. Riggs was connected to it. And then Muir Glacier has retreated to a point where it no longer is tidewater. And so let's follow the final retreat of Muir Glacier. This is a picture I took in 1976, and it was August of 76. And what I want to say about this, just to put it in perspective, Muir Glacier was calving so rapidly that there were huge splash waves. And consequently, this lighter colored rock, which is an intrusive rock, it's a rock called aplite, was able to support a marine algae because the rock was wet enough that the algae could establish itself even two or three meters above normal high tide. And that was due to the continuous splash waves from the glaciers. As Muir continued to change and retreat, so we went from a visage that looked like this to this, 
This is the 2003 picture. So we're looking at 27 years for the ice to completely disappear. There was no longer splash waves. The applite was dry. The algae died. And the first alder started to come in. So this is the kind of rapid landscape evolution and vegetative succession that is accompanying the rapid retreat of glaciers in Glacier Bay. So 1976-2003. This is another photo. I took this in August of 78. And I had no idea that I was going to be coming back. And I looked at this picture any number of times over the years. And I did not know there was a 4,000-foot mountain sitting right here. I thought those were clouds. But when I came back in 2003 and photographed the landscape again, it was clear that that was the top of the mountain. You can actually see the ridges that you can see clearly exposed in the bare ice here, in the bare rock. Um, they were there in what I thought was the wispy clouds of, of the 1978 time framework. So again, you can see by the time of this picture, Muir is on land. In fact, it's back almost a half a kilometer and actually retreated out of the water about 1992 or three. Another view of the retreating New York terminus, 1980, 2003. And this is going to be the last pair I'll show you of um, New York Glacier's retreat, 1976, 2003. And again, to put all this in perspective, this is where the glacier was in 1941. It's retreated. This is where the wet algae was right here by this stream in 1977-78 time framework. Retreated out of the water in the early 1990s. Was still a fairly good sized glacier connected to its major tributary in 2004. By 2009, it was starting to stagnate, starting to separate quite a distance from, from the edge of the water. And this is a picture from, I'm sorry, this is September 2015. I beg your pardon. That's 15, not 9. So I did not update my caption correctly. But this is what it looked like in, in uh, 9. You can see the terminus extended a significant distance beyond the juncture. And in 2015, the terminus has retreated back from about here to where it is. And it's in the process of separating from its primary tributary. So I'm going to stop there. And I'll be happy to entertain any questions that you might have. But I hope this gives you some insights into the rapidly changing landscape of Glacier Bay, starting from the perspective of what it looked like at the time of John Muir to what it looks like as of September of last year. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. In Alaska or in Glacier Bay? In Glacier Bay. No. There are, well, I, I take that back. Johns Hopkins has this strange history. It was way back at the time of the Harriman Expedition. And it actually continued to retreat till about 1940, when it was actually in Canada. Began advancing around 1940 and has reached a very recent maximum position around 2000, 2005, and it fluctuates. So some years it's at the maximum, maybe a little bit beyond where it had been. Some years it's back. But it is the only glacier that I call a healthy glacier in, in Glacier Bay. All of the others are changing dramatically, most of them for the worse. There are four or five other large glaciers, two in the park, um, but they're out on the Gulf of Alaska coastline. Um, the Tudor Glacier and North Crillon Glacier, which are close to their maximum positions that they've been at for the last 50 or so years. And those are glaciers that began advancing in the 1700s, late, 16th, um, late 17th century, early 18th century, and have continued to advance up to the present. And they sit under mountains that are over 10,000 feet, so they've got a significant amount of um, catchment area. And then there are two or three others um, along the coast Almost all the glaciers in Alaska that are currently advancing, and there are five or six, as they say, are within 20 to 30 kilometers of the Pacific Ocean. Other questions? Yes? How was the work that you did starting back in 2000, how was that ultimately used? 
the reason that Deputy Secretary Hayes asked that question, as we are now in an environment where climate doubters were quite abundant, there was a um, similar um, major effort that actually was funded by people who had previously um, tried to sell the fact that tobacco wasn't good for your health, or tobacco had no deleterious impacts on your health. And so um, he was looking for some kind of anecdotal evidence that we could put out that would help convey to the public that climate was actually changing. And as I said, my response was, why not photos of glaciers? I don't know if I could come up with anything better and just put them out with a little bit of information to describe where and, and when. So by 2004, I had about 35 good pairs of images. And I made them available to several different locations, to the professional science organizations like AAAS and AGU. Um, I gave a set of my photos to um, National Snow and Ice Data Center. And um, the word started to get out that Muir Inlet 1941 2004 photo pair, and um, sometimes with the triplet, has been published probably more than 500 times by media around the world. And um, almost any time there's any kind of a climate convention of some sort, someone will send me an email that my picture showed up either on um, CNN or, or some, some media outlet um, and being used time and time again to, uh, to document how rapidly landscapes do change. Um, I try not to get into the controversy as to why they're changing. I have opinions and clearly it's climate related, but um, my, my message is it is changing. And it changes in different ways. And in some cases, the changes are actually causing some glaciers to get larger than they had been. Some of the climate detractors will say, well, that's unequivocal proof that um, climate change isn't real. But you know, con climate change is far more complicated than a simple, yeah, it's going to get warm tomorrow and the next day it's going to be even warmer. It's, it's quite complex. But being able to look at every continent where there are glaciers and see that over the last 200 years, they've been shrinking everywhere with a few exceptions, but 99 plus percent of all the glaciers on Earth are decreasing in area and volume. And in many locations, they have disappeared. And many smaller glaciers at lower elevations in Alaska are disappearing. And even where the bigger ones are advancing, their former tributaries at lower elevations are disappearing because they're getting nourished from much higher elevations where it's still the right climate conditions or the right weather conditions for new snow to form and metamorphose into glacier ice. You're welcome. I have a website that has um, about 75 of these pairs on it that anybody can download. We actually put them up in high resolution, and um, um, frequently I'll see pictures that I know came from the website being um, displayed in, in different um, media outlet events of one kind or another. Any other questions? Yes? How about the overall ocean level? Have you been able to notice a lot of change in the images that you have? No, because um, there are a lot of things that can that, that actually make ocean dynamics very unusual. Um, about four years ago, I got a call from a reporter from the New York Times who was perplexed that sea level was falling in Juneau. And in fact, it's falling all along the southern coast of Alaska because of the tectonic uplift, as well as something called isostatic rebound. When all these glaciers were there, they depressed the coast. And now that they've melted, the coast is rebounding. And so around the mouth of Glacier Bay, it's going up more than three inches a year. And so some of the sites that were shoreline at the time of the Herman expedition are now 12 or 13 feet above sea level. So in Alaska, you have a hard time documenting sea level rise, unless you go up the coast into the Arctic, where it's a very low relief, soft sediment coastline where most of the sediments held together by ice and as the ice is melting, the sea is rapidly intruding. So it depends on where you are. Yeah. But not from this, yeah. not, not from the Juneau area. In fact, there are lots of places in Alaska that are being sedimented in by rapid glacier sedimentation and uplift. Yes? Is it, isn't that what they're reporting in Greenland now, is the ice cap in Greenland is melting? Yeah, rapidly. It started, we, we would, um, 10 years ago, the statement that was made, or 15 years ago, there are any number of workshops at the end of the last century saying primary source of glacier meltwater entering the world oceans, British Columbia and coastal Alaska. Now it's clear that Antarctica and Greenland are about equal, but they greatly exceed all of the other temperate glaciers on Earth. And so um, right now, without question, Greenland is 
losing, especially in southern Greenland, large amounts of fjord glaciers. And the same is happening in the Antarctic Peninsula. You go to the South Pole, nothing's changed there. It's mean annual temperature is below minus 40. And it's thickening a couple inches a year. But the perimeters of Greenland, perimeters of Antarctica, definitely seeing major impacts of glacier ice loss. And there's a NASA experiment called GRACE, which is a gravity measuring satellite. And it measures large area of gravity change. And you can see in the perimeters of Antarctica and Greenland dramatic volumes of water being lost. Well, you have to remember that the greatest majority of the land is in the northern hemisphere. And at the North Pole, there's nothing but 18,000 feet of water. So you have totally different atmospheric circulation patterns. Um, you get temperature gradients, so it's still equally cold at the North Pole and South Pole. South Pole is 10,000 feet higher. But no, um, the glaciers in the tropics, whether they're north or south of the equator, are melting. Glaciers in the mid-latitudes, whether they're north or south of the equator, are melting. And glaciers around the perimeters of both Antarctica and, and Greenland are melting. Other questions? So has the loss then of the glacier water into the bay, how does that change? Well, it doesn't change the, the bay. Well, there's much less sediment now in Glacier Bay than there was at the time of Muir, because there's much less runoff coming from the glaciers. So the species that lived on the nutrients that were in that sediment, many of them are gone. Used to be a very, very intense shrimp fishery for a number of years um, around the margins of the glaciers. And there used to be um, um, fish that ate the shrimp. So you had, again, a little microecosystem. And there was the um, uh, Kitslitz murlet, is the species of bird that lived on the small fish that ate the, 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 the shrimp larvae. Um, they're all gone. And it's all due to the sediment disappearing and the nutrients disappearing with it. So there are definite changes, but in terms of the water, you know, the water in Glacier Bay, um, you can't see any evidence of the, the sea level rise there. Tides in Glacier Bays are 15 feet. So it's hard to see, you know, to get a baseline. But um, remember, everything is popping up three inches a year in Lower Glacier Bay. Other questions? Go right ahead. Yes. Yeah, there's a, well, Tamagus Davis is um, located 10 miles from the park headquarters. It's got a population of 600. There is a uh, Mahuna village um, across the inlet from the mouth of Glacier Bay. Um, no, there are no indigenous people living in the park. But um, well, the reason for that is when the ice advanced in the 16th century, it destroyed their village, and they relocated outside the park, and never were able to move back in. But there are, it's you know, it's a populated area. There are any number of subsistence um, lifestyle people who live along that coastline, but not in the park. If there are no other questions, I thank you very much for your your attention.